Section 2, Overview of Photosynthesis. Life on Earth is solar powered. The core class of plants use a process called photosynthesis to capture light energy from the sun and convert it to chemical energy stored in sugars and other organic molecules. Plants and other autotrophs are the producers of the biosphere. Photosynthesis nourishes almost all the living world directly or indirectly. Some organisms are called producers because they produce the source of chemical energy for themselves and for other organisms. Photosynthesis captures energy from the sun to make sugars that store chemical energy. In the last lesson, we talked about biochemical pathways. Photosynthesis is one of these. While the equations look simple, the entire process is really just a series of reactions linked together by the products of the previous one. Here we have cellular respiration on the top, just as a comparison to photosynthesis on the bottom. You can see that water, oxygen, glucose, and carbon dioxide are all necessary for both of those. They are reliant on one another. So where does photosynthesis happen? In elementary school, you probably learned it happens in plants. Then in middle school, you learned it happened in plant cells. And maybe even you learned in the chloroplast. Now that you're in high school, you'll learn that it actually happens inside the chloroplast on something called a thylakoid membrane, and it also occurs in the stroma. In this picture, you can see the chloroplast. You can see the double membrane. Inside, you see the thylakoids, the space on the inside of the thylakoids, which are just a bunch of flattened discs made of membranes. And then the stroma is just the fluid portion inside. If we get really in depth, we can see here's where all of this process is occurring. Look at the structure of a leaf. First is the mesophyll, which is the tissue that's made up of photosynthetic cells containing chloroplasts. You can see our chloroplasts here in these mesophyll cells, meso meaning middle. The epidermis, which is the outer covering of the leaf. This secretes a waxy coating called a cuticle, which prevents water loss from the cells and directs raindrops to the ground so that the roots can absorb them. Then there's the stomata, these little holes on the bottom. These pores in the leaf extend the surface area and they allow for gases to be exchanged in and out. So carbon dioxide in, oxygen out. And finally, the guard cells that are right next to that. The guard cells are responsible for opening or closing the stomata depending on the temperatures. Water loss is dependent on those guard cells functioning. If they're open during the hottest part of the day, the water evaporates out, the plant wilts. The carbon dioxide can only enter when those stomata are open. So inside the leaf, there are plant cells that contain about a half a million chloroplasts per square millimeter of the leaf surface. The color of the leaf comes from the chlorophyll, or the green pigment that's inside the chloroplasts. That pigment is embedded in the membrane of the thylakoid. Chlorophyll plays an important role in the absorption of light. We will learn later that it isn't the only pigment molecule present, but it is the most predominant. The thylakoids are flattened sacs of membranes forming stacks that we call grana. The stroma is the space between the grana. The light dependent reactions capture energy from sunlight. It takes place in the thylakoid the water and sunlight are needed for this process to occur. Chlorophyll absorbs energy. Energy is then transferred along that thylakoid membrane and then into the light in dependent reactions. Oxygen is released at this stage. In the next section, we will go more in depth with each of these steps. Next come the light in dependent reactions. We used to call them the light and the dark reactions, but now we call them light independent. That's the part where we're actually making the sugar. So this part takes place in the stroma. It needs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It uses energy to build the sugar in the cycle of chemical reactions. So it's important for you guys to realize that the carbon dioxide that goes to make that sugar molecule, that glucose, the carbon comes from CO2 in the air. So the same thing that you breathe out. The plants take in, reassemble it, 
literally plants are making matter out of thin air. The equation for the overall process is six carbon dioxides and six waters. They go in, they do their thing, and they come out one glucose molecule and six oxygens. So let's talk about light real quick. Light energy travels in waves. We get ours from the sun. We can't even see most of what gets here, but it's still important. This is the visible part of the spectrum. We have x-rays and cosmic rays, there's infrared, there's microwaves, there's radar. Here you can see human vision versus UV vision, which would be the ultraviolet, simulated B vision and bird vision. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that works. How do they see things differently? So why do plants appear green and how do we see? In order to see things, there has to be two things present. There has to be light and there has to be pigment. Light travels into your eye and it hits the back where it activates your rods and cones. The rods are responsible for seeing light and dark, while the cones serve to give us colors. Humans are what we call trichromatic, meaning we have three cones. We have red, blue, and green, or long, medium, and short waves. If you look at a pixelated screen, you'll actually see those three, because in all honesty, that's the only three colors that humans can see. Those are the three colors, and when they're activated, they light up, and that's how we see something. So trichromatics like primates and humans versus tetrachromatics like fish, birds, insects, reindeer, and even some humans they're finding. Tetrachromatics have four cones in the backs of their eyes, which is why those of you hunters know if you're turkey hunting, you have to have really good camouflage because the birds can see really well. So you see the difference here. This is what we can see, and this is what birds can see. Now there's pentachromatics, like pigeons and butterflies, and then there's a mantis shrimp that actually has 16 color cones, giving them the ability to recognize colors that we can't even imagine. In class, we do the light demonstration where we look at a prism breaking up the white light. We compare that on a colored sheet of paper here, and you can see how some colors actually absorb the light and some reflect it back. So if you are colorblind, that just means that you have some defective cones. So if you're non-colorblind, you're able to see through all the colors of the rainbow. If your red cones are defective or your green cones are defective, you'd only be able to see these shades. If the blue cones were defective, you'd be able to see these. So when you look at something that's pigmented or colored, light strikes it and then is reflected back to your eye. That's what's received by your brain. So plants appear green to us because chlorophyll is a green pigment and it's reflecting green light back to your eye. So think about when you wear a white shirt in the summertime and the sun hits it, all of that light reflects back off of it because there's no pigment there to absorb that light. Whereas if you're wearing a black shirt, it's going to absorb all of the light. So chlorophyll A is the main player. It's a green pigment that's in the membrane. And chlorophyll B, along with carotenoids, are what we call accessory pigments. And those allow more light to actually be used. We're actually able to harness more wavelengths of light. Luckily for us, A and B, as well as those carotenoids, can help the plant absorb more wavelengths and ultimately harness more of the sun's energy. It makes them more efficient. Those other pigment colors are also responsible for why the leaves get their fall colors. They always have those reds and oranges and yellow colors but there's so much chlorophyll A and B that we can't see it until fall when the daylight starts getting shorter, the chlorophyll starts dying off, and then we can start to see those other colors. So that yellow line represents the carotenoids, all the different colors that it can absorb versus chlorophyll A. It's primarily here and here. Next, the light energy is converted to chemical energy through what we call the photosystem one and photosystem two. We will diagram the phylocoid membrane in class, and we will 
discuss what each of these primary electron acceptors and energy molecules do. So you're funny for the lesson. Chlorophyll, awesome at absorbing red and blue light. Green light, not so much. 